Wild Jobs Namibia with Rudy and Marlies is proudly sponsored by Vintuk Lager. Namibia, land of the brave. Brave men and women who dedicate their lives to protecting a country of harsh terrain, ancient cultures and vulnerable wildlife. Namibian conservationists Dr. Rudy and Marlies van Vieden are on a mission to travel the length and breadth of Namibia to meet these intrepid individuals and to witness the incredible work they undertake on a daily basis. These are the unsung heroes of Namibian conservation and these are their wild jobs. The Namibian coastline, with its rugged beauty, is luring more and more people to her. Tourists, adventurers, fishermen and industries, they are flocking to the coast of Namibia. And obviously, the more people, the bigger the impact on the environment. And that's why we're here. Namibia's coastline has become a conservation focal point. And as an animal lover, I want to see a seal, a pelican, as many animals, actually all the animals on this coastline. And I want to meet the people that take care of the environment and work with these people. Namibia became independent in 1990. And from the period 1990 to 1994, this was the border between South Africa and Namibia. So we've just left South Africa and entered Namibia. On the one side is Volfus Bay, then still part of South Africa, and on the other side of the fence, the Namib Naukluft Park. A unique feature of the park is a place called Sandwich Harbour. Ecologically, it is of great importance. Access is controlled in a very practical way by nature. You can only drive there during low tide. Then our Sandwich Harbour guru is taking us into Sandwich Harbour. But getting into Sandwich Harbour is not that easy because you have to go through this very narrow funnel where the dunes stop against the sea. And if you don't time it perfectly, then the water will, will catch you here and you will become a sandwich. It will sandwich you, yes. The Saline Lagoon is a paradise for bird lovers. On a good day, up to 50 different species can be found here. In 1995, it was declared as a wetland of international importance by Ramsar. It's an incredible place. There's very few people that has the privilege to see a place like this. But why is it so important in, in terms of coastal conservation? This is maybe one of the most important wetlands in Africa, the third most important. And in Southern Africa, maybe the most important. It hosts up to 350,000 migrating birds in the summer months. In the winter months, up to 100,000. The river used to come into regular into the ocean, so this used to be a freshwater lagoon. But over time, with all the sand coming in, the dunes is getting bigger, the dunes is moving closer to the ocean, and it just close up the whole freshwater lagoon.
Venturing into the dunes here can be risky, and it's best to drive in a convoy of at least two vehicles. There is no cell phone signal, and should you get stuck with nobody knowing your whereabouts, you could be in serious trouble. The dunes here are constantly changing shape due to the prevailing winds. Nice and cool, huh? Oh, sure. Let's take some fresh water. Is there water here? Yeah, sure. Ah, how do you Hell. know about it? Because it's cool. Cool. Uh -huh. I see. It doesn't take a narrow scientist to figure out that there's water. Oh, look at it. Very, very shallow water. Oh, there. there you go. There you go. So it's not salty. Oh. It's okay. Give it to mum. I'll drink it all my feet. <laughs> I like your sand shoes. How does it taste? Mm, it's nice. The Kusep River has its origin 480 kilometers inland from here in the Komas Highlands. For a river to find its way to the ocean through a desert is not easy. So much sand and mud have been deposited over the years that the river only reaches the sea when it is in flood. The last time this happened was in 1963. it is easy to miss the small treasures it has to offer. This is amazing. There's two little eggs of a white-fronted flower in the middle of nowhere. I almost stepped on it. This is exactly the reason why people shouldn't go off-roading. I mean, you can either step on them or just drive over them. It's so beautiful. Sure. Wild Jobs Namibia with Rudy and Marlies is proudly sponsored by Vintuk Lager. Wild Jobs Namibia with Rudy and Marlies is proudly sponsored by Vintuk Lager. Near Henty's Bay and not far from the coast lies something that is difficult to see with the naked eye. Not because it is too small, but rather it is so big that it is difficult to comprehend in one glance. The Mesum crater is 132 to 135 million years old. From one side to the other side is 18 kilometers. There's two theories that it was created by a meteorite, and then there was another theory that it's actually a volcanic eruption. And consensus was reached, and it's a volcanic eruption. It was one of the biggest volcanic eruptions in the world. To explore the crater and learn more about the vegetation of this desolate place, Marlies and Rudy met up with Fricky van Solems, who knows this area like the back of his hand. Fricky, we're here at a very unique plant. How old is this Velvetia? Well, they, uh, they are also known as uh, the pre-time historic plants, very old. This one should be more than 2,000 years old. We tested one of this. Uh, and that was already 2,200 years, the carbon testing. You know where you took oh, a piece yeah. of you. So that was already. It's an amazing plant to look at it because it looks like, you know, a, a, basically a tree that's been chopped in yeah. half and then yeah. leaves yeah. growing from everywhere. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to show you later, but this is really like this. You've got only two leaves. Okay. But they grow only, not only uh, all the way. You find them only in certain spots. And there's a very good reason for it because they need 
apparently two sixes also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That so, we will also have a look at. Yeah. Then you have got so that's one of the female. reasons and the habitat, yeah. Yeah. the habitat, height. Height, everything is playing a role. So that's making them really unique in the world. Okay. Uh, no, but I want to see a male, because this is apparently, you said a this female? is a female, because she's got seats on it. Yeah. Okay, let's go see a male. Let's go and see a male and a female. Sure, this is a beautiful plant. Oh, that's that's a Namibian sunflower. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful example. <laughs> so this is a, a female plant, that's you a see, because of the yeah. seed. That's the seed, the bulbs on it. Okay. Uh, you can see that's the way that they, when they are old already, the seed is in here. We told you already about the seed now, but that's the way. With the female, you find on them like this. So how does this happen? Do you, because this is a female plant, yeah. you need a male plant, yeah. but yeah. how do they how do they get pollen out? Yeah. So you've got two little beetles. We call them the, the Velvicha beetles. And Fricky's name for them, okay. Yeah. Velvicha the beetles. The red one and the yellow one, okay. the male and the female. So, so can we look for them? Okay, I've got the female. Yeah, okay, hold on. That red one, that's the male. Okay. You see, that's the male and the female. So what they do is they go for the, the flower. Yeah. And uh, in that process, they are pollinizing the different plants. They okay. move from one plant to So they go from plant. flower to flower yeah. and then they pollinate. They also say the wind might play a role in all that stuff, but you find them only at this plant. That's all. All right. That's so the main, let's, main way let's that see how the male looks like. Yeah. So this is a male behind you. That's a male. That's a male. And that's the juices. You can see the dew. Like oh, it looks oh, nice. Already, yeah. Uh, Looks like little bells also. They don't open up, they are just like this. While the female is getting a bit later, it's really flowering, like opening up. So sweet. Sure, beautiful. Also to be found in the Messam crater are lichen fields. Some of these fields are estimated to be hundreds, if not thousands of years old. And there are hundreds of different species here in the central Namib. They are only found on west-facing slopes, and this way they benefit from the fog drifting in from the ocean. Fricky, we're here in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of little plants. All these hills are black. Is there a specific reason for it? Yeah, you know, they are called the lichens. We know the oldest plants that you can find. Uh, they were part of the dinosaurs. Specific, growing only from the seaside, from the sea already, up to, you find them even in the Brandberg and up to the Waterba. Different kinds, about 400 different kinds all over Namibia. But over here we find plus minus 100. Every one of them, uh, very interesting about them, actually it is a symbiosis between a plant and a little animal. So the green that you see behind us, that is the plants. They use the chlorophyll from the sunlight to produce food for a little animal, a little that is living on the bottom, organisms. And, and the, the, between the two of them, they actually are restoring the lost sand of the Namib. They are turning it back to fertilizing it again. That is a big problem with us in Namibia, you know, people not knowing this. If you walk in here, you've got about one millimeter of fertilizing ground. And interesting is you will see that they grow only on little stones. And as they cover the area, then slowly they also reproduce for the sand. So at another spot you will see how it's already covered. So many times you find people just walking or even driving with 4x4s. If you are traveling with a 4x4 for one hour, you are damaging one hectare and they will never recover. They are growing at one millimeter in 10 years. One millimeter? One millimeter. So for the human eye, you cannot even see them. So, and you will see, very interesting, they are growing on the south, southwestern side of the mountain because the fog is coming in from the seaside. Uh, because it's wet, it's low moving, the wind is pushing it in and then forcing it up on the mountain. And then you find this condensing on the plants. And when the sun is hot within, like the spot behind us, within one, two hours, it's dead again. But early morning, or if you've got a little shower, a totally green arm up. Then they call it the green arm up. Now this is like a lichen 
nursery here. Yeah, yeah. The Namib never ceases to amaze us. So I think, Fricky, you can now explain to us, you will practically show us how these little plants become alive. Wake up. Yeah. Right. Come stand here and make a force nut. With like a fair spite. Dry, dry spite. We spite here in the middle of my nut. Frickie, I see here is different colors, red ones, green ones, big leaves, and even little white, like a grayish yeah, yeah. silver color. Yeah. yeah. No, eventually you just see the the green, totally green, especially with the sun coming out now, it's beautiful. But the moment you come close to the rock, look at the one really speaking up. Sure. And this is always growing on the outside. It's always like a flower just going on in circles, in circles. It looks like the... veins, eh? Yeah. It does. This one again. Look. Sure. They're always on a rock. And see how big nice. it's opening up now. Very now nice. that it got even, water. Yeah, yeah. And even the, the, the little so. white stuff that you see, they are lichens, that white stuff. So you've got black ones. I take just this big rock from over here. Look at this one. Beautiful. And that one is now black, but it's turning totally green. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Namap never ceases no to end. amaze you. No end. Wild Jobs Namibia with Rudy and Marlies is proudly sponsored by Vintuk Lager. Wild Jobs Namibia with Rudy and Marlies is proudly sponsored by Vintuk Lager. Volfus Bay is renowned for its harbour, which is a centre for imports and exports. For nature lovers, it also offers unique access to marine life. Marlies and Rudy met up with Peter Pretorius from Mola Mola for this experience. Here. Hungry, species? greedy pelicans. <laughs> that I know. Uh, well, it's the, the eastern white pelican, which is the one you find pretty much on the sort of southern and western coast of Africa. This is one of the unique places where you really get to experience them up close, and I love that. I mean, the fact that you can actually see them this close is incredible. Why are they so tame? Uh, every year during the breeding season, November, December, the winds, we get a lot of strong wind here because of the desert and the cold ocean. Some of the chicks blow into the water and traditionally people would bring them to the Mola Mola office and we'd raise them and they very quickly, I mean within two days, they start taking fish and when they get bigger, we leave the cage open and they start integrating into the wild pelican. So that's how it started. But many of these pelicans are now wild pelicans that have just learned that, listen, I can go to the lagoon when the tide is low and I can get easy food, or I can fly with a boat in the morning and get a few easy food as well. And they go back and do their thing again. So totally wild living, but over time they just become habituated to people. So it's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, uh, demand and supply, I guess. They want food, we give it to them and they're happy. But it's brilliant that they can actually go back to the wild. Yeah, these, I mean, I don't know exactly these. I mean, some of them were rings, but these, these could be literally wild pelicans wild that ones. learned it from other ones. And it's not that they're not reliant on this at all. I mean, they get a few fish from us, but the rest of the day they go back and do their thing. So um, it's absolutely awesome. And how do you tell the, the sex difference? I see some of them pink and some are yellow, or orange. Yes, these are females, both of these. The males go a bit more like sort of this reddish orange, almost like you have in the beak here. Yeah. Like that color on the face. And then they're also in breeding season, they get these big, um, like knobs on the front of the head, but really big. I mean, it looks almost strange, you know. Okay, brilliant. And then these are both adults, obviously, just from the coloration. And the, the first year and a half or so, two years even, there's a bit of brown and dark feathers in the, in the body. And, and the I males also get these beautiful plumes around the oh, head. Oh, okay. And I see they've got like this pinkish glow to them on their feathers. They're, they're like a pink... Yeah, some of them more like so than others. Um, Probably because of the same reasons the flamingos obviously to much more or greater extent, but the robodopsin, the bacteria that you get in salt water. And they with a lot of food they eat, obviously, well, almost That's all the, the food they eat would be from salt water. And pelicans also, as you know, can survive pretty well in, in freshwater areas, but obviously most of the pelicans we see on the coast. Thank you. They're gorgeous. They're really gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. For me, this is probably one of the highlights for people to 
Yeah. And I see this on a daily basis. For people to see the seal colony is brilliant, to experience a boat ride. Many people have never been on a boat. But to see these birds this close, I mean, it really makes... And people come back and they tell us in the office, like, yo, we've never imagined that we could see pelicans like this. And it really... Um, uh, I almost want to say they're great ambassadors for other pelicans. People appreciate them so much more after them. Thank you. And for me, always interesting that the seal that we find here is very interesting because 20 years ago there were no seals at this at this area on the sandbank. This is a relatively new um, colony. We're talking less than 20 years that there's been seals here at all. Um, and now it's about 50,000 to even up to 80,000 in the breeding season. People say that the number of seals has increased so much that it's damaged the Namibian fishing industry. Is that true? Again, I'm always very careful to step out on, a, on the... Actually, I'm not. I like stepping out onto limbs, but you are stepping out onto a limb to, to, to state that as a fact. Uh, from my opinion, in general, and, and this is in, in the bigger picture of conservation as well, I'm, I'm very careful to blame any wildlife for taking over or, or cutting into natural resources, purely because if you look at any numbers, any, and this goes for, from a seal to a bird to a land mammal mm. to sea mammals, um, they are less than they were 100 or 200 years ago. Um, so to blame seals for fish numbers dropping while we've got 8 billion people mass fishing the ocean, mm. I think that's just uh, uncalled for. So, mm. so personally, I don't, totally I don't think we can blame the seals for dipping into our fish mm. numbers. We should look at, you know, billions of people. Yeah. Um, so I think to blame them is, is, is not fair. They need to feed, they need to eat. Uh, it would have been much easier for them as well 100 years ago, uh, pre many Because there was much more. Yeah. A lot more natural yeah. resources, which we dipped into. Yeah, mm. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> From the known to the unknown, the expected to the unexpected, the rich diversity of the Namibian coastline and adjacent interior makes it well worth a visit. The fact that one can get so close to wild animals and is exposed to nature makes it a unique experience. Wild Jobs Namibia with Rudy and Marlies is proudly sponsored by Vintuk Lager.